beyond peaking. The need for COVID tests at a premium. Nationwide COVID cases and hospitalizations are dropping, but the Omicron wave isn't over. The wide-ranging spread of the variant remains in the West and parts of the Midwest, prompting a dire need for at-home testing. And here now to talk about the at-home testing rollout and so much more is Dr. Raj Desgupta. Thank you for joining us tonight. Oh, thank you for having me once again. So let's talk about the at-home testing rollout. It came early. Is this going to be a game changer? No more waiting in long lines, waiting days for results, especially for asymptomatic people who might just be skipping the testing altogether? So I think it's great, and there's really no downside in getting these tests, but that's a really strong word, Rudebe. Is it a game changer? I don't think at this point it's going to be a game changer. And, you know, from the beginning I said getting testing, the right quantity of tests, a number of them, the quality of tests, it's going to be essential. So we know that a, a positive test is truly positive and a negative test is truly negative. What I want to do is to give some tips if you get your hands on these tests the government's giving out to make the most of them. And I think the first thing is, is don't wait to order these tests. I know in some states that there are already sold out. I saw your segment before mine. They're hard to get. So by the time you wait to order the test, if you have symptoms, it's too late. Second is most people are going to be using this test after an exposure. And if you have no symptoms after exposure, don't test right away. You probably won't be secure if that's a negative test. Wait a few days before testing, assuming you're not symptomatic. And the last thing is my opinion. And I feel that these tests are going to be the best when we talk about deciding if you're positive or negative. I wouldn't use those to break quarantine, break isolation. Why? It's because of the, the honor system. So if there's an individual who is positive for COVID, it's day five, they have no symptoms whatsoever, and then they test and it's positive, are they going to stay home? And that's what makes Omicron such a deadly and frustrating variant because Omicron makes you sick, but not sick enough to stay home the whole time until the isolation is done. You go back and you may infect others. So it's nice the government gave those tests. Use my tips. Use the test wisely. Good tips. Um, so we've been hearing, we just heard Michael Shore talk about it, about COVID becoming endemic as opposed to a pandemic. What does that mean? So let me give you the short answer. I do agree with them. I think that it is going to be going in depth eventually, but there are a lot of terms that just confuse everyone. What is an epidemic, pandemic, and endemic? So an epidemic is when there's a sudden burst and rise of infection disease in one geographic area. A pandemic is very, very similar to an epidemic, except it's across countries, across continents. Then an endemic, what we're talking about, is just when disease kind of lives amongst us, and hopefully it's going to be under control. And the example we always use is influenza virus. But wait, what is the real big question is, are we going to require an annual vaccine? And the answer is, we don't really know just yet because there are many viruses and infections that are endemic right now. They fall under the category of the common cold. So there's rhinovirus and adenovirus, there's RSV, and they don't require an annual vaccination. Contrary to that, the classic example is influenza virus. So the bottom line point here is that, yes, I think it's eventually going to be endemic. We still need to study it to find out, do we need those vaccines eventually? And a lot of people are just resigned to the to the notion that this is never going to go away. You might as well just purposely get infected. At least it's Omicron. It should be more mild. Let's just get it over with uh, and get on with our lives. What is your advice on that? Have you had patients come in and ask you that? Uh, definitely, yes. I heard about this for like the last couple of weeks. And I got to tell you, all the emotions I get when I hear it, anger, frustration, sadness, because number one, my colleagues, my friends around the country and world working their tails off in hospitals and ICUs, they're suffering. So I feel really bad. So here's going to be my reasons not to get infected. Number one, it's not just a common cold. You know, I have, uh, you know, colleagues that caught this. It gives you chills and rigors and chest pain and sweats at night. It's horrible. Number two, it's never about yourself. It's about others. So if you go out there and infect a cancer survivor, once you affect someone's immunocompromised, what about my little girl who's two and a half years old who doesn't have a vaccine? Number three, no, we always talk about the acute symptoms. And sure, you know, maybe you don't have any, but what about the long haulers? Would you risk having brain fog and fatigue and chronic pain the rest of your life? And the last thing is because please don't overwhelm the healthcare system at this point. The more that we're positive, we take the time away for all the healthcare workers, we're forgetting all the other diseases we need to treat. So please do not do that. I'm convinced. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I want to talk to you also about this new study. It came out in the American Journal of Epidemiology, and it added to the evidence that the vaccine does not lead to infertility among men or women, but that men who have recently had COVID have a lower chance of conceiving. 
still a lot of expectant parents and couples out there hoping to get pregnant who are still scared of the vaccine. What does this new study t tell us? So I actually read that study also, and my bottom line is I'm not surprised. I've always said that when we talk about SARS-CoV-2, otherwise known as novel coronavirus, it affects every single organ in the body. So if you're to tell me does it affect the male reproductive tract, I want to say, why not? And how does it do that? It reduces the sperm count. But you know what? That's not unique to you know SARS-CoV-2. When we talk about other viruses, the classic example is something called the mumps. Maybe someone remembers that. When you get infected, you get these enlarged parotid glands. You have infertility, sperm camps really go down. And how do we actually battle that? Hey, take the MMR vaccine, the measles, mumps, rubella. You know what? Even influenza virus reduces sperm counts after an infection. So when you say that um, COVID-19, when you're infected, can cause that, I am not surprised. But what does this study tell me? Get vaccinated so you won't have infertility. And I got to throw something else in there for women. The American College of Obstructive and Gynecology said that, you know, if you want to conceive, if you're pregnant, get the vaccine. If you're breastfeeding, get the vaccine. It not only helps the mom, it helps the baby. So I think that study for men and the information out there from ACOG for women is essential. Get vaccinated. Dr. Raj, thank you so much for your advice, as always. <laughs> thank you very nice much, Nice to see Rhett. you. Nice to see you, too.